Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining our onboarding webinar, DNA Nexus Essentials. My name is Carolyn Claude, and I will be your moderator for today. I'd like to spend a few minutes covering some housekeeping items and going over our agenda. Uh, so first of all, this uh, webinar will be recorded and sent to all registrants via email after today's session. And uh, you will see a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them in this Q&A box and we'll address all questions in the last uh, 20 minutes of today's session. Your speaker for today is Anikit Deshpande, Senior Solution Scientist on the Expandage team. Anikit has a decade of experience working at companies including Kaijin, Gnome, Pacific Biosciences, and Novartis to accelerate precision medicine research in research and clinical settings. Anikit will give you an introduction to the DNA Nexus platform architecture and launch into a demo of how you can use the platform to run workflows and projects. With that, Anikit, uh, take it away. Thanks, Caroline, and welcome everybody to this another session for about the uh, introduction to the DNA Nexus platform. Uh, I'm uh, Anikit Deshpande, as Caroline mentioned, I'll be walking you through uh, the DNA Nexus platform architecture as well as the core DNA Nexus platform concepts. Uh, we'll be also walking through a very simple use case in which uh, you can use the platform uh, to run a specific NGS pipeline in a secure and compliant manner. So with that, I'm gonna go to the next slide. Uh, and this slide is a very high level overview of the DNA Nexus platform architecture, which gives us an idea on what encompasses the DNA Nexus platform. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have a very strong security and compliance boundary that enables our users to run their genomic and other multi-omic workflows uh, securely in the cloud. What this secure and compliant foundation means that we have a, a compliance framework such as uh, the FedRAMP moderate uh, certification that we've gotten earlier this year, as well as the most commonly uh, used framework such as ISO 2101, QMS, and HIPAA. We also provide 24-7 uh, support uh, for our users, and this is not just limited to technical support, but it's also scientific support. So if you have workflows and tools that you would like to run on DNA Nexus's platform, you can uh, contact our support, which, which would be happy, we would be happy to help you out in actually assisting you to run those workflows in the DNA Nexus platform environment. Uh, the second layer kind of speaks to the bioinformaticians or the data scientists in the room. Uh, as most of you might be running uh, your current workloads in uh, a public cloud or on uh, a local HPC environment, we realize it's really important to engage with the community and support the most commonly used workflow languages. This might be uh, the common workflow language right here or the workflow development language or the WIDL framework right here. So what this means is if you have workflows that are developed in these uh, languages, the DNA Nexus toolkit, which is a command line toolkit, can compile those workflows uh, into a DNA Nexus workflow. So this makes it easier for you to port your on-prem workflows into the DNA Nexus platform. Uh, if you're using or leveraging Docker to manage dependencies, you can uh, also use the DNA Nexus toolkit to manage the same dependencies within the DNA Nexus platform. Uh, and finally, for the data scientists in the room, uh, if you're familiar with working with R or Jupyter Lab in running your exploratory data analysis, uh, we support those features as well. Uh, if uh, your data, if, if you have a requirement of scaling those data analysis, uh, we also provide a Spark backend to enable you to scale your analysis without having actually having to worry about spinning up a Spark cluster and maintaining the Spark cluster. So these are fairly advanced topics that we'll be covering in the subsequent webinars. Uh, but for this uh, specific webinar, we'll be covering the fundamentals of DNA Nexus platform. And for that, uh, the projects framework or the projects layer is one of the most fundamental concepts on the platform. 
Uh, we'll be going into a little bit more detail in the actual demo itself. But what a project does is enables our users to share uh, any kind of data objects uh, with one or many different users in a secure and compliant manner. So these data objects might be workflows, they might be containers, they might be apps or any kind of data. Uh, this kind of enables our users to share and collaborate within uh, their own organization or with external collaborators. We also built in uh, standard visualization tools for the most commonly used NGS workflow files or, or, or NGS files. So these might be BAM files or FASTQ files. Those could be visualized within the DNA Nexus platform under the visualization tab. Uh, and finally, uh, in terms of support, we have 24 seven support, uh, not just scientific, but also technical support as well. The third layer is uh, consists of the API. Uh, all our calls, whether it's from the web interface or the command line interface, goes through a single layer of API. Uh, our users who are familiar with developing their own pipelines can also develop their applications using the software development kit on the DNA Nexus platform. Uh, this might be in Java or Python. So you can develop your own tools and you're not restricted to any of the tools that we see right here. And finally, we, we find it really important to be as flexible as possible within your current workflow needs and your current environments. So we've developed uh, plenty of tools for upstream and downstream integration. So these might mean pulling data in from a limb system or directly from a sequencer and exporting data to say, for instance, a new R system. So we've developed those tools to pull direct data directly from multiple sources, not just from an HPC system. And using those building blocks in blue, uh, you can build several solutions on top of DNA Nexus. Uh, some of them are secondary analysis, which is um, generally processing raw reads files to an actual gradient report. Uh, it might be translational informatics, which is more uh, exploratory in nature. Uh, it might be GXP compliant lockdown workflows for clinical trials or uh, custom communities in which we uh, customize the look and feel of the user interface for specific applications. Good examples here are the PFDA platform and the St. Jude Cloud. So this, this slide gives you uh, or gives us a very high level overview of what, uh, what, what are the core features of the core concepts of the DNA Nexus platform and how we could leverage that in building different applications on top of it. And with that, uh, I'm just going to right, go ahead and see the actual platform in action. So let me just go ahead and exit away from uh, my PowerPoint. So right here, I am at uh, my web browser, which is Google Chrome. I can go on, or, use, or a user can go on to platform.dnanexus.com right on top. Uh, and this should take you to the DNA Nexus login page. Uh, you can go ahead and create an account. And once you click on create an account, you can pull in your personal information uh, as well as your account information. Choose a default cloud region. Uh, as you may know, DNA Nexus is multi-region, multi-cloud. Uh, so it gives you the flexibility of choosing your underlying cloud region while maintaining the same look and feel, the same experience across multiple regions. And once you create an account, uh, you can go ahead and log in to the platform. Since I already have an account, let's just go ahead and log in. And once I click log in, uh, it takes me to uh, the two-factor authentication. Uh, this is an optional security feature that we built in. So I can go ahead and add in my two-factor authentication code that's sent to my mobile device. So that's five, four, nine. And once I entered the right code. Uh, the next uh, step is, or, or the next page is the DNA Nexus projects landing page. So once you log into the platform, you can see I have a list of projects that have already been created in uh, my current account. Uh, so just to back up a little bit and 
try to explain the concept of a project that we mentioned earlier. A project is basically our security and compliance boundary. Uh, you can think of it as a folder in the cloud within the DNA Nexus platform with uh, access controls built in and some metadata features that are captured by default. So you can see there are multiple projects that I have in my account. Uh, it also gives me, the platform also gives me some amount of metadata like what's the total data usage within these platforms? What's my access privilege level for each one of these pro projects? The total number of members that have access to the contents of this specific project, as well as additional metadata fields that can be added or removed, such as I can add in the regions tab right here, which shows me the region in which this project and all its contents resides on. So as you can see, we have AWS US East, and we have some regions in Azure as well, such as Azure Amsterdam. Uh, what just kind of tells us is the DNA Nexus platform gives a consistent user experience across different regions as, as well as different cloud service providers. Uh, it's the single pane of glass experience in terms of running the same workflows and apps across different regions that gives you the flexibility of running your genomics analysis without having to uh, be too much concerned about what's happening in the back end. So as my next step, since you've gone over some of the metadata associated with the projects, I'm gonna create a new project. Say for instance, I have some data that's come in from the lab and I need to get that process through the DNA Nexus platform. Uh, for that, I can create a new project by hitting the new project tab on the top right hand corner. Uh, that pulls up the new project uh, window I can give my project any name that I would like. So if I have some whole exome samples, I can call it, uh, let's call it where, spin off demo or whole exome samples. I can also specify the billing account, uh, who would be responsible for paying for the compute and storage for this specific project. So that billing account might be an individual one that might be associated with an institution. That's something that I can choose uh, by the drop down list right here. And finally, since DNA Nexus is multi region, multi cloud, uh, I can also choose the underlying region to base my project on. So I can say that I want my project to be created in, say, AWS Germany or Azure West in the US. Uh, this again is not a complete list of all our regions. We have several regions in APAC as well. So for a complete list, please shoot us a line. We can share the list of all the regions in which DNA Nexus's platform uh, is available. So I'm just gonna stick to US East uh, for now. I can also add in customized metadata. So I can say this project has whole exam samples. Uh, I can give it a project sum summary saying, whole exam sequencing samples for analysis. I can give it a project description and I can add in a lot of context in what I'm trying to achieve and what does the contents of this project consist of. Uh, I can also add customized key value properties uh, in terms of uh, name of the project or any kind of properties that you would like to define as. So the metadata framework is fairly flexible we do capture metadata by default, but we also give our users the option of adding in their own metadata to any object on the platform, not just projects. Finally, while creating a project or before creating a project, I also have the option of uh, specifying my access policy privilege levels. Uh, what this, this means is I can restrict access to the contents of this project by just toggling these on and off buttons, let's just get rid of this. Uh, so I can say, uh, I don't want any of the users who would have access to this project to download or delete any kind of data or copy any data from this project to a different project. So this kind of satisfies some of the most stringent policies that some of you might require in which uh, no other user would come uh, and delete or copy or share data because it's specified in the access policies for your so we give you the option of actually enforcing that uh, at the outset or at any point in the project's life cycle if you are an admin of the project. 
So uh, let's just leave the access policies as default and hit create project. And once I do that, you can see it creates an empty folder. Uh, the next question that I would have or would like to address is, uh, how do I get data into the BNN access platform? Now, there are several ways of doing this. Uh, the most obvious way is to uh, drag and drop files from your computer by clicking on the upload data tab. I wouldn't recommend this for large FASTQ files or BAM files. This, this is mainly for users who are not familiar with the command line interface. Uh, they can drag and drop files directly using this feature in DNN Access's UI. Uh, if you are aware of an external database that you would like to import into the DNN Access environment, uh, you can also provide the actual valid URL. So if there's a new release for say Thousand Genomes or Cosmic, you can directly import those databases uh, by providing the valid URL within the platform. So you can select multiple URLs and if you do a check on the validity of that specific URL before importing as well. Uh, but since most of you might be familiar with the command line uh, and you've been using command line for a long time, for that we have the DX toolkit and the uploader agent, which you can install on any kind of OS, whether it's a Mac OS or a Linux computer or a Windows computer and directly stream data from either your HPC or uh, the, the instrument, the sequencing instrument directly into the DNA Nexus platform. Uh, we will be covering some of these advanced concepts in the subsequent webinars, uh, but for uh, the UI, these are the two ways of getting data into the DNA Nexus platform. Uh, just a quick addition to uh, importing data. So if you have data that lives in say a third party uh, cloud solution such as AWS or Microsoft Azure, we have specialized applications that are built that can directly pull in data from an external party source by providing your token to that account. So there are several uh, ways of importing data into the DNA Nexus platform. It completely depends on where your data lives and what's the most uh, convenient approach for you to import data into the platform. For the demo purpose, I'm going to copy data from a, uh, from a separate project that I have access to. So I'm just going to hit on the copy data from a project that pulls up all the projects that I have access to in my account. I'm going to navigate to a demo project called Demo Data. Uh, in this project, as you can see, there are multiple folders uh, with some RNA-seq and whole exome sequencing data. I'm just going to check on all these files and I'm going to say copy. And that pulls in or copies almost all the files right here instantaneously. Uh, this is one of the features of the DNA Nexus platform that we built in which uh, files are not literally copied or duplicated on the platform. Uh, only the references for any objects are copied within the platform. How does that, uh, how does it affect our users? Uh, that results in uh, significant cost savings on your end because you wouldn't be duplicating multiple copies of the same FASCI file for this instance. Uh, within different projects. So you could go ahead and select and copy these files in as many projects and share that with as many users without having to physically duplicate data. This is enabled by uh, the immutability of all objects on the platform, as well as the end-to-end -end provenance that we built in. So if I go to the settings tab of the specific project, I can see I have copied about uh, almost 174 gigs of data uh, almost instantaneously. And the reason for that, we just, we just copied the reference for those files. We haven't really copied the actual or duplicated the actual files in, in itself. In the settings tab, we also give our users full transparency into uh, the storage cost for all the contents within the specific project. So I can see what's the approximate cost for storing this amount of data. I have the same metadata that I've put in. Uh, 
while creating a project I have the same access control policies that we set before creating the project I can go ahead and change that uh, and I can also add and edit any of these properties it, as and when I see see fit uh, I can also transfer this project to a different user if I would like that user to be built for the specific project so the project frameworks is very flexible to share and collaborate with multiple different users as well as giving you the transparency on what uh, what's the cost of hosting a specific project on DNA Nexus? Going back to the manage tab, let's go ahead into one of these folders and investigate some of the files that we've copied in. So I can, I can see two FASTQ files about five uh, and a half gigabytes in size. What I'm going to do here is going to right click and hit info and that pulls up uh, the info tab for a specific object. In this case, it's a FASCI file. Uh, it gives me uh, the name of the FASCI file. It gives me the path for it, the class of the specific file, the region in which this file lives, as well as the unique ID, which gets copied around once you copy these files from different, uh, different users. It also gives me additional default metadata in terms of size, who created it, who modified it, uh, and in this case, it also captures the metadata associated with this file. So I have the SRR numbers, as well as some ID and species information about this file. So you can modify the metadata before uploading it into DNA Nexus by either associating a JSON file with any object or specifying it explicitly through the UI. It can be automated at the upload stage as well but the metadata stays with all the files once you transfer the files or copy the files from one project to another. I'm gonna leave the metadata as default, but uh, I can also go ahead and uh, since we've gotten some data into our project, the next step is uh, that I would like just to share this, this uh, data with uh, additional user or a group of users within DNA Nexus. Uh, in order to share the data within a project, I can go to the share tab right here on the top right hand side. And that pulls up the shared project tab. As you can see, there's just one user that has access to all the contents within the specific project. Uh, as uh, a policy in DNA Nexus, we do not get uh, access to your contents within your project unless we are explicitly added as users. And that applies to every user on the DNA Nexus platform. So if you create a new project, you and only you would have access to all the contents, unless you go ahead and add a separate member or a user. So let's just go ahead and do that. Go and add in another account that I have access to. Uh, I can also specify the access privilege level for this specific user. So I can say, I just want to give this specific user of viewer account of viewer access levels in which they can just view and download data but won't be able to run won't be able to run upload or incur any charges on the platform i can give the user an upload or access in which uh, the users can user can upload data but cannot run or edit any analysis uh, a contributor would be someone who's like a computational biologist or a bioinformatician who could run the analysis on the platform and incur compute charges. And an administrator would be someone with complete admin access to the contents of this project as well. So let's just add in this user as a contributor. I can also add in a group of users uh, associated with a lab or with a team within a large company. So let's just add in a group of users part of DNA Nexus as a viewer to this project. So all the users associated with the org DNA Nexus would have viewer access into the contents of this project as well. And you can go ahead and remove them as well as and when you seem fit. So sharing projects uh, gives us a very uh, easy interface to uh, share not just workflows, not just data, but results within those workflows in a secure and compliant manner. Uh, while specifying the guardrails in which users can either view, edit, or run analysis on the platform. So 
we shared this data with another user, the next step in, uh, in my demo process would be to run some analysis on the DNA Nexus platform. I've gotten some data, I've explored the metadata associated with one of the objects, I've shared this with a user. Uh, the next thing is what I would like to run an analysis on the platform. And for that, I can go to the tools tab on the top left hand side and just click on the tools library, which should pull up uh, a list of the most commonly available public tools on DNA Nexus. Again, this is not a complete list of all the tools available on DNA Nexus. This is just an example list that we like to put out there uh, just to show you the capabilities of the SDK, uh, as well as help our users to run the analysis as well. If you have your own scripts, either written in R or Python or any other language, you too can develop an app on the DNA Nexus using the SDK and share that app with one or many different users. So we are not limiting you to all the tools in the DNA Nexus platform. We want this to be just an example in which you guys can use it to build your, your own analysis tools. So uh, as you can see, there's a list of tools right here with some additional metadata on the side. Uh, I can sort by category saying, hey, I just want to look at RNA-seq tools. So that would just pull up all the tools that are tagged by RNA-seq. Uh, if you have a specific tool in mind, such as BWMM, you can just go ahead and just search for the tool name and that would pull up all the hits for that specific tool name. Uh, in this case, it's PWMM, which is a very popular read mapper. Uh, so I'm just gonna choose this one right here. Uh, it's called the BWM FASTQ read mapper. Uh, one, and once I click on the actual link for the tool, it takes me to a readme page with some basic information about uh, what this tool does. So uh, this gives our users who are not really familiar with the bioinformatics or the computational biology tools to read through the analysis, the readme to understand what's being done with their data. Uh, for the bioinformaticians in the room who are most savvy on the command line, you can also run the specific tool by installing the DX toolkit on your local computer and running the commands right here, which is mentioned uh, uh, here. So you can run the analysis uh, through your local computer by downloading the DX toolkit uh, and running the commands listed here as well. Uh, you also have additional metadata associated with this application, uh, such as the regions in which this tool is available. Since the NNX is multi-region, multi-cloud, uh, you have the ability to run the exact same analysis across multi multiple regions. So the regions are listed right here. Uh, you also have a change log for the tool. So we have version control that's built in that tells you what was updated with uh, each new version of the PWM FASTQ read mapper. So this change log or this version control is uh, related to the public tool, not the version of PWMM. That's a separate version number as well. Finally, I'm, you can go and scroll down to see the inputs and the outputs requirements here. But since we are going to be short on time, uh, we are just going to go ahead and say, let's just run this analysis using the UI. So let's just click on that. And once I click on that, I uh, go back to my projects tab as well with all the projects listed. So I can just go ahead and select the current project uh, that we just created and imported some data. And once I select that current project, I can see uh, the tool runners page in which uh, my inputs for the BWM FASTQ read mapper is on my left-hand side. The required inputs are highlighted in orange. So if I hover over them, I can see uh, a little info box with the required inputs. In this case, it's uh, the unmapped reads in a FASTQ format. Uh, we also need a, a reference file a, for BWA to actually map those reads to the reference. So let's just go ahead and provide those input files. So I'm just gonna click on that one. I'm gonna select all the FASTQ files. Uh, or for demo purposes, I'm gonna select a very small subset of FASTQ files. So this is just 86 megabytes. But if you wanna run this on all FASTQ files, you can also select all right here. 
but let's just go ahead and select this guy. I'm going to select the right mates as well. So let's just select the right mates. Uh, I can also select the reference genome. So we can, once I click on the reference genome, I can either navigate to the reference genome that I just imported right here or navigate to a list of publicly available reference genomes uh, as suggested here. So we make available a list of the most commonly used reference genomes for multiple organisms that can be used for any analysis as well. So this is provided as a resource for all users in DNA Nexus. Let's just go back and just select the first one. And once I've satisfied all my input requirements, uh, the application gives me a signal that this app is ready to be run. So that says it's runnable right here. Uh, but just before we run the application, let's just go over the, the parameters for DNA Nexus. For that, I'm gonna click on the gear icon right here, which pulls up a nice readme, excuse me, on the left-hand side. Uh, it gives you a much more abbreviated version of how and what this specific application does. Uh, it also gives you command line options of running this application uh, for multiple files, not just one single FASTQ file. Uh, so you can go ahead and read that if you're more interested in batch running applications. But on the right hand side, I can see I have different versions for the specific tool that I can select. Uh, I can specify an output folder. Uh, I can also specify the underlying instance type. Uh, the instance in this context is the machine in which you're going to be running your application on. So if you have a, a script that uses high memory, then you can select an instance or customize an instance with higher memory and more storage. And that's pretty flexible through the UI as well. So I can go ahead and mix and match my instance types based on my my, uh, my resource requirements for the specific application. Uh, since this is optimized to run on BWMM, we have a default instance type right here. So let's just stick with that. You can also go ahead and change the parameters for BWMM. Um, again, the uh, DNA Nexus SDK is fairly flexible enough. And since all the applications are open to the public, you can go ahead and modify any of these information and uh, modify the application and build it as an applet on your uh, project. So all of these parameters for the tools, all the logic that goes into running a tool is modifiable by our users using the DNA Nexus, DNA Nexus SDK. You can also lock down certain parameters or remove them if you're familiar with uh, building applications on DNA Nexus. So, this is fairly straightforward for a use UI user, but it gives you a lot of flexibility as a bioinformatician or a computational biologist to define the parameters for your, your own analysis. So let's just go ahead and leave these as default. Go back to the actual runner page. Uh, and since I'm satisfied with the input files, I provided a reference genome, I've also provided and gone over the parameters for this specific application. I can click run as analysis and that should take me to the monitor tab, which is our third tab within us, within our project. And this shows me all the analysis that are deployed uh, within a specific project. So you can deploy multiple analysis here, but we've just deployed one, which is called BWM FASTQ Read Mapper. Uh, there's some additional metadata associated with this analysis as well, such as the executable ID, as well as who launched this analysis and when. Uh, we also provide a real-time pricing for each one of these analysis, and you can add in your own guardrails by saying, hey, I want my analysis to time out in like six hours. That would really help you to uh, prevent any unforeseen cost overruns because of an error in the application itself. So let's just go ahead and click on the analysis, which should take us to the analysis page. Uh, as you can see, each job on DNA Nexus, like it, each object has a unique job ID. 
Uh, it also gives me additional metadata that we went over before that, uh, but it also gives me full provenance for my analysis. So it tells me what's the executable that we are running this analysis on, uh, as well as the input files with the links to the actual input files. So if you're running an analysis, uh, maybe three months ago and you do not know what was actually run, you can always go back to the job ID and retrace your steps to figure out what was exactly run in a specific analysis and what were the exact parameters and input files that were used here. I can also look under the hood if you are mostly if you are more technical in nature by clicking on the view log tab. Uh, once the analysis Analysis starts running, you can see the actual underlying log files or the log commands for BWMM. And this is really helpful for debugging certain analysis without having to uh, actually log into the platform using the CLI. So if I click on the view log tab, you can see the actual BWMM commands that are being run in almost real time. Okay, this should load up. Let's just refresh it. So this is taking a little bit longer to load. Let's just go back to the actual monitor tab and uh, see a higher level of all the analysis that are run uh, on the platform. As you can see, the real-time price is also being updated as the analysis runs. This is a fairly small file, so it should take about two minutes, or less than two minutes to actually run the analysis. But this shows you how can you run a very simple analysis on the DNA Nexus platform using the UI. Uh, the last uh, thing that I would like to show is uh, most of you wouldn't be running a single analysis with a single set of files. Uh, you would want to chain your analysis into a more logical workflow for running your analysis across uh, multiple samples. And for that, we provided the workflow framework that enables you to define your own logic and execution order of your workflow. So if you can go right here to the manage tab and under the manage tab, you can go to the new workflow button. And if I click on the new workflow button, um, this gives me a blank canvas to define all my applications and the order of execution of all the applications. So let's just give a very uh, relevant name for our workflow. Let's just call this whole exam sequencing workflow. I can go ahead and then add in multiple steps to the specific workflow. So I can add in a fast QC step by uh, defining fast QC, uh, or I can just go ahead and add BWA. So let's just search on BWA. Since I've already called variants and I have a BAM file, I can add in a variant caller. Let's just add in a very simple variant caller called as three days. Right, I'm trying to find it. Let's just go ahead and refresh this. So uh, I'm going to refresh it so that it reloads the page. All right, that's much better. So let's just go back onto the workflow that we are ready, ready to define. I've added in one single application. Let's just go add in another one, just for example, to hit. Let's just call this free days and hit enter. That should search through my application library uh, for the word free. So I can add in a variant caller right now. I can also add in a fast Q, uh, C for QC. I can add in uh, an R script to actually generate multiple plots. Uh, you can add in any kind of tool that's available on DNA Nexus or any tool that you developed as part of the SDK as well and define your own workflows in that manner. So let's just stick to two tools right now since this is uh, just for demo purposes. Since I have two applications or two tools right here, I can go ahead and link those two tools to define the order, order of execution flow. So I can drag the output of the first tool as the input of the second tool. And that kind of creates a link between these two tools so that you can go directly from a FASTQ file 
to a variance calls file. And subsequently, you can add in many tools and link those tools in a, in a flow as well so that you can go from one uh, raw reads file into a final result that you've defined towards the end. end. So in that case, uh, I can also go ahead and select my input files. So let's just go ahead and select that. I'm going to select the read pairs as well. I'm also going to select the reference genome. Select the same type of reference genome. And once I've selected and satisfied all the workflow requirements, uh, I can go ahead and hit start analysis. And that would validate all the input files and the output files for this specific workflow, which, we've, which we are calling whole exome sequencing workflow. And once I'm ready to actually run the workflow, I can go ahead and run the analysis right here. Similarly to our last analysis, which is done in under two minutes, uh, the workflow is executed, but the only difference here is within the workflow, we have two apps that are gonna be run. Once the first app is completed, the second app would run uh, and so on and so forth. So you can define your own analysis types and also define the order of execution. Um, in, in terms of the smart reuse, uh, the system is also smart enough to prompt the user to skip a specific step if the inputs, the outputs, and the parameters for that specific step is already been run within an account within DNA Nexus. So uh, what this means for our users that there might be cost savings on your end as well. Uh, if you run the exact same application with the exact same parameters and the in inputs as well. So you have the option of skipping over analysis that are already previously run, which would translate into cost savings on your end in terms of compute. Uh, in terms of compute charges as well. Let's just go back to the manage tab since we've, uh, or the monitor tab since we've run two analysis uh, and just go over the one that's just completed. So if I go right here, I can see I've run BWM FASTQ read mapper on a couple of FASTQ files, which have generated a, a BAM file right here. Since we have full traceability and provenance built into all analysis on the platform, I can link out the exact same BAM file, which was created right now. Uh, if I click on that, it takes me to the exact file that's created. And if I look through the info column, it also gives me full provenance in the info column in which it states that this file was created by me by running this specific application in this specific job. So all of the provenance is captured by default, which enables our users to go back to the previous analysis and retrace their steps uh, and so that there's no analysis information or metadata that's lost in the system. Finally, in terms of visualizing data, since we've run a couple of workflows or one workflow and one application, you can go to the visualize tab right here and uh, check some of the most commonly used visualizers for bioinformatics. Uh, this might be just IGV for visualizing pileups and BAM files uh, or uh, FASTQ IO bio for looking to the quality of a specific incoming FASTQ file. Uh, this viewers sent data across to the web viewers so that you can visualize the data in a much more seamless fashion uh, instead of downloading the actual raw files onto your computer and then pulling up IGV. So this is a much easier way of visualizing these most commonly used, commonly, commonly used files uh, by uh, using the inbuilt DNA Nexus visualizers right here. Finally, uh, this kind of gives you an idea of how you can use DNA Nexus to run a very simple workflow. Uh, there is a lot more that, that the platform can do in terms of scaling to multiple jobs in multiple workflows or building your own applications uh, specific to your analysis needs, those topics will be covered in our subsequent sessions, which will be, which will be more specific and more technical. But I hope this kind of gives you an idea of the core concepts of the DNA Nexus platform 
and how do you how can you use it to share and collaborate and run basic analysis on the DNA Nexus platform? And with that, uh, I'm just going to go back to the actual slides and talk a little bit about uh, the documentation that we have. Just uh, just going to blow this up. All right, so for any questions or further online resources for downloading any of the command line toolkits that we mentioned in a demo, uh, you can go to documentation.dnanexus.com, which uh, gives you a lot of video tutorials as well as links to um, the actual analysis that we ran. So everything that we covered today is available online, excuse me, uh, in documentation.dnanexus.com. And finally, a quick shout out to the Xvantage group. Uh, we realized that migrating to the cloud from an HPC system is, uh, is, is kind of hard. Uh, and for that, we built a group of professional services uh, that enable you uh, throughout the whole life cycle of migrating your workloads, whether it's genomic or multi-omic to the cloud. So uh, the Xvantage group, which consists uh, a team of bioinformaticians uh, help you in actually developing either your own workflows on DNA Nexus uh, or porting those existing workflows from an HPC system or a local computer onto DNA Nexus. Uh, we also help in data harmonization in which you can pull in data from different sources into a database. Uh, we also develop customized portals in which we can define the, you, the kind of look and feel of your analysis, uh, the precision FDA and the stain tube clouds are good examples of uh, the DNA Nexus portals, which leverage all of the core portal functionalities or the DNA Nexus core functionalities. Uh, if you're running uh, GXP workflows, uh, we can help you in deploying those workflows as well. Uh, we also do genome assemblies as a service on multiple organisms. Uh, as well as training and customer support, which we call DNA Nexus Xvantage Care. So the Xvantage group uh, kind of is your partner in the journey from migrating your, your workloads from an on-prem system into a cloud environment, such as DNA Nexus. So we'll be happy to learn from you and from your processes and to help you in that process. And with that, uh, our webinar kind of comes to an end. Uh, I would want to hand this over to Caroline who would uh, give us an, uh, would give us more information on the upcoming webinars and the topics that we would cover in the subsequent webinar series. So I hope this was uh, helpful. I'm uh, excited to hear about your questions, but Caroline, uh, could you take it from here? Sure, thank you, Annika. So as Annika mentioned, I'd like to just highlight uh, upcoming webinars. So next uh, week, November 7th, we'll have the second part of our two-part series of uh, tips and tricks using Whittle and Docker, developing locally and scaling to the cloud. This second part is gonna be focused on uh, Whittle. So um, to register for this, please go to dnanexus.com backslash Xvantage group. You'll be able to register for this as well as request access to the recorded version of the first part, which was focused on Docker. So um, dnanexus.com slash Xvantage group is going to host um, all of our upcoming webinars. So check back there uh, to see what other topics we're going to be going into over the next couple weeks, as well as um, this information will be provided with our monthly newsletter, which you can subscribe to on our website. And then uh, with that, we can move on to questions. Um, as a reminder, please type any questions that you have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we will uh, go ahead and answer them. Uh, Anna Kate, if you can move to the next slide. Thank you. All right, so our first question uh, that came in is, um, uh, how can I bring my own apps onto DNA Nexus? <clears throat> Great. So uh, 
as mentioned before, uh, if you have any kind of scripts that are written in either Python or R or any language, uh, you can leverage the DNMXS SDK. Uh, the link for the SDK is provided in the documentation.dnnexus.com. You can download that SDK into any kind of operating, most commonly available operating system. That may be Linux, uh, Windows, or, uh, or any kind of more, uh, popular operating system. Uh, the SDK kind of provides a framework to encapsulate your apps or your scripts into a DNA Nexus application. And once you've encapsulated and provided the inputs and the outputs, you can build that application as uh, a DNA Nexus app and run that on the platform. So the SDK is built in, in a very flexible framework that enables our developers to develop their own applications on the platform. Great, thank you. And uh, the next question is, how do I get data into the platform from non-standard HPC system? Sure. So uh, for non-standard HPC, I, I'm assuming this is going to be either a laptop or, you know, disk drives. Uh, we have several tools that we develop for pulling in data from different systems, not just HPC. Uh, you can, again, go to dnnexus.documentation.dnnexus.com and download the uploader agent, uh, which is a command line toolkit that enables you to do multi-parallel uploads from any system uh, that you would like to upload data. So it, it provides some additional features. It's very similar to RSync, but it's built, uh, has more additional features in which it does an MD5 sum check on each one of the chunks that are uploaded so that the data integrity is maintained. It can do multi-parallel uploads, as I mentioned, as well as it can resume and upload if the connection is in interrupted in the middle. So I would go ahead and check for uh, the DNXS upload agent for uploading large amounts of data onto the DNXS platform. And that's uh, applicable for non-HPC systems as well. Perfect, thank you. It seems that that is all of our questions for today, unless anyone has any last minute ones that they'd like to be answered. Um, Moving forward, uh, as Anna had mentioned, you can find resources on documentation.dnanexus.com and uh, you can look out for upcoming webinars at dnanexus.com backslash expandage group. And then as always, if you have uh, support questions, feel free to reach out at support at dnanexus.com. And then uh, uh, this, as I mentioned, will be sent out to you uh, so you can review the recording as well as have access to all of these links. Uh, we thank everyone for joining today and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Anakit. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.